the 18th century brought more enlightened visitors who were in search of scientific and geographic discoveries. British captain James Cook was unique in his curiosity about the people and cultures of our island world. He was also the first to recognize the immensity of its global expanse. How shall we account for this nation having spread itself to so many detached islands, so widely disjoined from each other in every quarter of the Pacific Ocean? We find these people from New Zealand in the south, as far as the Sandwich Islands in the north, and in another direction from Easter Island to the Hebrides. How much farther in either direction its colonies reach is not known, but what we know already in consequence of this voyage warrants our pronouncing it to be by far the most extensive nation upon Earth. We have learned a great deal about the lives of our ancestors from the journals and drawings of Cook's three voyages in the Pacific. When Captain Cook came to Tahiti on his first voyage, he met a navigator who guided him around the neighboring islands. Several of the natives were daily offering themselves to go away with us, and as it was thought they must be of use to us in our future discoveries, we resolved to bring away one whose name is Tupaya, a chief and a priest. While sailing with Cook over thousands of miles of open ocean, Tupaya was always able to point exactly towards Tahiti without referring to any kind of map or instrument. He drew a map for Cook that showed the location of 74 islands stretching over 2,000 miles of the Pacific. After several months at sea, the British ships reached New Zealand. Cook had learned some Tahitian, but not enough to communicate with the Maori people. Tupaya spoke to them in his own language, and it was an agreeable surprise to us to find that they perfectly understood him. They have the same notions of the creation of the world as the people of the South Sea Islands have, but nothing is so great a proof of they all having had one source as their language. On his second voyage to the Pacific, Cook sailed to the easternmost island of Polynesia, Easter Island. Legendary navigator Hotu Matua had discovered this remote island more than a thousand years earlier. The inhabitants of this isle, from what we've been able to see of them, do not exceed six or seven hundred souls. Nature has hardly provided it with anything fit for man to eat or drink. As small and as mean as the canoes were, it was a matter of wonder to us where they got the wood to build them with. They do not seem capable of carrying above four persons and are by no means fit for any distant navigation. Cook found hundreds of giant stone statues scattered across the island, standing guard over the villages and resting unfinished in the quarry. Constructing them exhausted the island's resources, leaving no trees for building large canoes. Unable to voyage out, the people of Easter Island were cut off from the rest of Polynesia, trapped on a barren land. On his third voyage, Cook sailed north of the equator and came upon Hawaii, the most isolated group of islands on Earth. He was surprised to find a healthy, thriving, and densely populated society. Canoes now began to arrive from all parts, so that before 10 o'clock there were not fewer than 1,000 about the two ships, most of them crowded with people and well laden with hogs and other productions of the island. Cook recognized that the Hawaiian natives were closely related to the people he had seen in New Zealand, Easter Island, and all the islands in between. But he never resolved the question of where they'd come from. Cook believed that the Polynesians originally came out of Asia, but he could not understand how their canoes could have sailed against the prevailing winds, which come from the Americas, from the east. Nearly 200 years after Cook's death, Norwegian adventurer Thor Heyerdahl built a balsa raft, Kontiki, and tried to recreate what he thought was the voyage of the first Polynesians. I realized that nobody could come from Indonesia to Polynesia by sailing against uh, the wind and the current. 
My theory has always been that the first settlement of Polynesia came from South America. In 1947, Heyerdahl and his crew set out from the waters off the coast of Peru. After months of drifting in the open ocean, Contiki reached an island in the Tuamotus in central Polynesia. We saw that it could be done. We did it. Herb Kane, artist and historian. All he proved was that you could tow a balsa raft out to where you could catch the prevailing wind and current and that would carry you to Polynesia. However, the plants and animals of the Polynesians and the language of the Polynesians all have roots in Southeast Asia. There's no question about that. Heyerdahl based his theory on the premise that the trade winds are permanent. In fact, the easterly trade winds die down for part of the year and are replaced by westerly winds. Tupaya had explained this to Captain Cook in 1769. Our ancestors used these seasonal wind shifts to sail to the east looking for new land. When the easterly trade winds returned, they could then navigate back to their home island. This two-way voyaging was essential to the culture's survival. The first voyage might be for exploration, but later voyages would carry the plants, animals, and people from one island to another. You see this, uh, when archaeologists searched for physical evidence to test Heyerdahl's theory of Polynesian origin, they did not find artifacts from South America. Among the objects they discovered was a unique type of pottery, lapita ware. These ceramic footprints trace the route of our ancestors from the western or Asian edge of the Pacific to the islands of Tonga and Samoa. Their descendants continued east to central Polynesia, then spread out to colonize Hawaii, Easter Island, and New Zealand. But there were many who believed that Polynesian canoe building systems and navigation systems were not adequate to the tasks and challenges of long-distance two-way voyaging. One of the leading skeptics was a writer named Andrew Sharp. Deliberate long voyaging and colonization were impossible. Hawaii, New Zealand and the other detached islands in the Pacific were each settled by one or more accidental one-way voyages of orphans of the storm or exiles hoping to find land. Sharp's skepticism became one of the challenges that uh, caused us to build Hokulea, Ben Finney, Tommy Holmes, and myself. Hokulea is a replica of an ancient Polynesian sailing canoe. The Hawaiian community built Hokulea to show that our traditional vessel could be navigated over long distances without modern instruments. Herb Kane designed Hokulea. His stories and paintings have taught young Hawaiians about our voyaging history. Polynesians were the only deep water sailors in the world for at least 2,000 years. The ocean was their own world and their only world. So they weren't really afraid of it in the same way that Europeans were afraid of it. We felt that by rebuilding what was the central object of Polynesia and putting it to active hard use that this would inspire a general revival of Polynesian culture. If culture loses its objects, it loses the use of them, the meaning of them, and cultural disintegration takes place. Far more than cultural disintegration has taken place in our islands. The colonizers and missionaries who followed Captain Cook brought devastating losses to our populations, our lands, our belief systems, and our connections with the past. Voyaging without a compass or instruments was made illegal in Tahiti and the Marquesas. In Hawaii, our ancestral lands were confiscated, then bought and sold among foreigners. Our grandparents were punished for speaking Hawaiian or dancing the hula. 
Ships from all over the world brought thousands of people to live and work on our islands. Their numbers increased and ours diminished. As our old people died and the young forgot our language, we lost immeasurable resources for passing on our history through oral tradition. By the mid 20th century, we Polynesians had not been practicing long distance voyaging or navigation for hundreds of years. The stories of ancient sea journeys and legendary navigators haunted us like fragments of a dreamlike past. Many of us saw the canoe Hokulea as a precious link to that past and to the seafaring people who first came to our islands. <laughs> 